Hello, this is uh, Bob Phillips, uh, First Baptist Church, Marydale, and uh, World Mission. And we're about to have one of our Bible studies and one of our lectures. And to, to, today we're going to be looking at uh, maybe the most unusual name that I've ever had for a, uh, a, a Bible study. And the name of it is, and there's a reason for it, is just because you are in the garage doesn't mean that you are a car. Now you're probably going to say, what does that have to do with the gospel? Well, I'm going to try to make it fit in. Uh, just because you are in the garage doesn't mean that you are a car. Now, to begin with, I want to analyze the garage and the car. There are many, many things that can occupy a garage. You can have a, a hole that you hold the ground with. You can have a rake. Uh, you can have tools which are uh, in, in boxes or metal cases, or they might be hung upon the wall, as, as a lot of guys like to do. You can have a... a riding a little more in the garage. Uh, you can have regular saws, uh, <clears throat> skill saws, chain saws. Uh, all kinds of things can be in the garage. So just because the car is in the garage doesn't mean that it's the only thing that can be in, in, in the garage. And the same thing is true with the Christian life. Um, if if you are in the garage and you are a car and, and you're supposed to be there, then that's a good place for you to be. And, and the same thing holds true to being in the church. And I quote, just because you're in the church or the church building doesn't mean that you are a Christian. Just because you're in the church doesn't really mean that you belong to Christ. Back to the garage. Just because you're in the garage doesn't mean that you are a car. And just because you're in the church doesn't mean that you are a sheep and that you have been regenerated. And our churches, I fear, in this day and time are, are full of unregenerate people. Uh, they're full of goats. Um, uh, many of them have more goats than they would like to have. And, and the dangerous thing is that it's very difficult to recognize a spiritual goat from a spiritual sheep. It's not a big uh, S of a forehead that lights up when a Christian walks in the door for the word sheep. It's not a big G on the forehead that lights up when a person walks in the door that says goat. And, and they're, they're there, I know they're there, because I've still got some bite marks and scars, and every pastor I know has goat bite marks on him from being bitten and attacked by the goats who are in the church proclaiming to be a Christian. So it can be a, a very dangerous thing. Uh, I want us to look tonight uh, at John, the 10th chapter. I said morning, but it is night. I got the lights on. Uh, in John the 10th chapter, we're going to look at the uh, the fact of Jesus talking about sheep. And he's, he's going to show us the distinguishing qualities of a sheep in lieu of a goat. And I want us to look at that tonight so we can better discern who are the goats and who are the sheep that might be in the church. Uh, we wouldn't have any problem finding a car in the garage. All we would have to do is walk out, look in the garage, and it would be obvious which, which item in the garage is a car. Unless you had an old Edsel in the garage. The Edsel, they say the Edsel was made of a, part of it was made of a Chevrolet, part of it of a Ford, part of it was Cadillac, part of it was Jeep. Part of it was Chrysler, part of it was, was uh, Plymouth, and they just took it and they put it all together like a puzzle, and you get an Etzel. I've seen those Etzels when I was growing up, and that's not far from the truth. 
but being an Edsel still is a car. Uh, first of all, we look at, at the 10th chapter of John, and uh, we want to look this morning at verse uh, verse 3. And in John 10, 3, it, it tells, us, tells us this. It says, To him the poor openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Now we we've been to Scotland a lot. We have a we've had in the past a partnership with a church on the Isle of of Isla, a small isle on the west coast of Scotland, right on the right on the ocean. And we we ran into a lot of sheep. We'd be driving down the road, and and uh, there would be a herd of sheep, physical sheep, that would walk across the road and stop, and the whole bunch of them would just sit there or stand there. And we couldn't get by. So we, we, we got to meet a lot of sheep. And the Scottish guys were telling us that um, the, the sheep will only hear their master and their owner and their shepherd. The same thing in the Middle East. The sheep, sheep do the same thing there. They told us in Scotland that if somebody other than the shepherd, the real shepherd, came in to the sheep yard or, or where the sheep might be in the vicinity and call them, they would come every single time. But if someone went to the gate of the sheep herd place where they stayed in the fold and a stranger called them, they would not even look up. They would not recognize his voice and they would pay him no heed whatsoever. And so a distinguishing mark of a real sheep in the church the distinguishing mark of a Christian is that they will hear the voice of their shepherd. They will hear the voice of Jesus. Not an audible voice, of course, but, but they will be able to recognize him. And, and if, if you're a Christian, you know what I mean. You, you recognize the Lord Jesus. Lost people can't recognize him. We can recognize him in other people. We can recognize him from the Word of God. We can recognize him from the, uh, the, the inward working of the Holy Spirit in us. God is in us. And so that, that's a beautiful thing. No other religion can say that, that their God lives within them. Uh, no one else can say that. But we can say that. And, and, and we hear his voice. So we, we look at the next verse, which is verse 4. And it says, And when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Another way we can tell if a person is a sheep instead of a goat, another way you might be able to tell that you're a sheep, is that, that you will follow the shepherd wherever he goes. The sheep are kind of dumb. They get lost real easy. Uh, they have a tendency not to find their way back home. And if they follow the shepherd, they will be safe. And, and they pay attention to the shepherd and they follow him. And, and the sheep who are in the church are going to be following Jesus. They're going to be conscious of, of wanting to please him. They're going to be conscious through the Holy Spirit of, of, of not wanting to sin because uh, if they do fall into temptation and sin, it's going to grieve them. It's going to hurt them. They're going to repent. And, and they're going to get rid of that sin in their life and ask, and just ask forgiveness, and and it, it, it's a it's a fact that people will follow their shepherd when they belong to the shepherd. Uh, if you've got someone in the church who, who is a goat, uh, you're going to have all kind of problems because Jesus is going to be going one way, and they're going to be going another way, and they're not going to follow the Lord Jesus, and consequently, it's going to cause friction and trouble and heartache between the church members. Because if you've got sheep and goats in the same fold, you've got a big problem. And there's going to be bickering. There's going to be complaining. There's going to be uh, egotistical desires. And there's going to be backbiting. There's going to be slander. And there's going to be all manner of evil going on by the ones who are goats who will not follow Jesus. Um, and then we look in verse 5, it says, And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. 
a Christian and a sheep in the church will follow Jesus and follow his voice and not run off following a stranger. And I think that's one of the greatest dangers in the modern day church in, in evangelicalism if, if there is such a thing as evangelicalism anymore. Uh, you, you have a multitude, thousands upon thousands upon tens of thousands upon tens of thousands, maybe even millions, of people who say they're sheep in the church today and they don't follow Jesus. One reason is mass media. You got the TV, you got all kind of social media, and everything imaginable is out there. And if you go to the church and you listen to your pastor, and he is a, um, a pastor who's been called by God, and he's the under shepherd, under the authority of our true shepherd, and he's preaching the gospel from the Bible correctly, you should follow him. So many times people leave the church, they go home, they get on the computer, they get on the television, and they listen to every conceivable ideology, philosophy, theology you can think of, and they get totally confused, and they have no idea where they're at or what they're doing. And then they come back, they begin to question the pastor. And so that's why I believe that it is crucially important that we teach systematic theology in our churches, and especially in our Reformed churches. That's not a bad thing. You, you can have expository preaching all you want. And I preach expository, and I'm preaching expository in this lesson today. But there's a desperate need also, and there's nothing wrong with teaching your people good doctrine and, and, and good theology, good Reformed theology. And I may be in the minority when I say this, but I'm going to say it because I believe it with all my heart. If you go from the first page of the Bible, preach expository all the way through it, an Armenian can come along and preach the same thing, they're not going to really know the difference because they're going to interpret the scriptures as they see fit, and then you have others who will go along and do it, and it's very difficult to know what the real truth is. I don't say that, that you should preach theology and doctrine all the time. I think expository preaching is very important. It gives you step by step, blow by blow, what's going on. You, you have everything in context. You go from one verse to the other, one chapter to the other. Uh, right now, we're, we're going through the Bible expositorily in Sunday school, and we discuss it. I did it on purpose so we could discuss it in our church at First Baptist Marydale, Maryland. And, and we, we discuss it. Everybody has their own opinion, and we come to a conclusion. Uh, sometimes we leave the room, we don't totally agree. But we're not really far off. We On Wednesday nights, we have been going through, uh, we started about five, six, seven years ago. I don't remember where it's at Genesis 1 1 in Sunday school. And now we're in the, I think it's the 18th chapter of Proverbs. Every single verse we studied. On Wednesday night, we do a expository study uh, through all different kinds of books in the Bible and, and go into more detail than we do on Sunday. On Sunday morning, I preach a great deal of expository preaching, but I also have preached for the last 10 years systematic theology and doctrine, good, sound doctrine. If you read Timothy, he talks about uh, five or six times is preach sound doctrine, preach sound doctrine, preach sound doctrine. And this is one reason why. If, if you preach systematic theology and, and you know what comes after the next doctrine and how they fit together in the whole scripture, you have a, a foundation, a, a superstructure, an architectural superstructure of what the faith means. Uh, if you don't do that, it's going to be very difficult to keep your people from becoming confused when a Mormon, Mormon teaches them, when a Seventh-day Adventist teaches them, when, when a um, Jehovah Witness teaches them, or, or someone else, or maybe even a, a, a Muslim. They, they are not going to have the tools to be able to discern the difference between the theologies which is correct and which is not correct. If they don't know about regeneration, if they don't know about 
the effectual calling, if they don't know about the everlasting covenant, if they don't know about uh, the atonement, if they don't know about uh, limited atonement, if they don't know about limited substitutionary atonement, if, if they don't know about the fact that gift, the gift, faith and, and, and repentance are a gift of God that's given to them that they can't earn, uh, if they don't know about justification, if they don't know about the doctrine of adoption, they are not going to be able to know what they believe, beloved. They're not going to be able, my friends, to, to, to put their theology together in a concise, coherent, scriptural way in order to defend the faith in apologetics against those that come against them, against those that are witnessing to them, and just in general with everybody. So, so systematic theology is very, very important. Doctrinal preaching is, is, is very, very important. That way, they will know when Jesus calls them. They will understand that uh, the charismatic movement is the largest cult in the world. And they have decimated and, and are attempting to destroy the Bible and the continuity of the Bible. Uh, they're not going to know whether, uh, if they're not doctrinally taught, whether tongues is a valid uh, scriptural doctrine that's in play today or whether it's not. So it's very, very important. But then, then we look on to the, the next verse. Um, the next verse, verse 5. Verse 5 says, uh, And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. And again, that's why we need to teach them the scriptures so they can understand them. And, and the only way for them to do that is to have systematic doctrinal preaching that they know in order, the beginning, the middle, the end. And when someone comes up to them and begins to teach them incorrectly uh, heresies, they're going to recognize it and they're going to flee from them. Uh, with the Holy Spirit in you, you will also flee from those who who are tempting you to sin. And, and, and the Holy Spirit is going to help us as true sheep to be able uh, to do that. You know, I can't do everything, I don't have enough time, but I'm going to skip down to verse 9. And he says, I, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Uh, he's the door of the sheep. You know, uh, again in Scotland, uh, if you've got a four-sided sheepfold made out of wood or whatever, uh, those sheep are going to go around there and they, they're going to be smart enough. You know, sheep are dumb animals. But they're going to be smart enough to know that the only way they're going to get into that, that place, that edifice there, is to finally go around where there's an opening and they see the door and they see the open door and then they will go in. And you you got people every day who pass by the church where the door's open and the door's closed, they have no desire whatsoever to go in. They will not. But we will know the door. Jesus says, I am, I am the door, and it's by me that you enter in and should be saved. He's the only way. And they would go out and find pasture. Uh, now, I, I got one guy in my church that, that calls me pastor, not pastor. Uh, but but they will, uh, they will. A sheep would find the pastor if he's hungry, and he would be able to eat and feed himself. And I am amazed in our church and and, and all the churches which are preaching the gospel, the true gospel, that people have a genuine hunger for the word of God, and we don't have a lot of elaborate programs that we do in our church. We just preach the word, and we teach the word, and we witness, and we do some, some things, but it's not program after program after program. But the main thing our people are concerned about is studying and getting fed by the word of God. And, 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 and just today, we had someone uh, in a Bible study that had been sick for a few weeks, and they were so happy to get back to the Bible study so they could study the word of God. They genuinely, sincerely, missed it and 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 that's the way it will be if we are true uh, sheep of Jesus and that will be another way that we can know that we're a sheep and we can divide the sheep uh, from from the goats uh, and then we'll look at verse 10 the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy 
I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. There, there are certainly thieves in Syria and Iraq at this moment with ISIS and the other groups, in particular ISIS, who are literally killing, they're literally stealing uh, a woman was on the Fox News last night talking uh, about the fact that they captured their village, they took her and her children. They not only tried to rape, rape her and did rape her, but they raped the children as well. They sell the little children into slavery. They, they take the little boys, eight, nine, ten years old, and they put guns on them and knives on them, and they teach them to be a ISIS cup so that they can go and kill and maim other people. And, and this group is so depraved and so bad that even the Muslims have nothing to do with them. They can see that they are not even spiritual enough to be a Muslim. They have prostituted the, the religion, they have desecrated it, and they've taken the very worst parts of it that Muhammad practiced in his early life, and they use that as their interpretation of Islam. And they're nothing but cutthroat, cowardly murderers and thieves who steal people's lands, attempt to steal people's souls, and, and kill them unmercifully for no reason. Even Allah did not say we should do all those things. And we as Christians certainly do not say we should do those things and, and we stand against them. So there are thieves that will come. Uh, the lady said uh, they come and they told her that the other people that you, you have two choices. You can convert to Islam or you can die. Now that shows a very great weakness of their doctrine and their theology because they are so afraid of Christianity, they're petrified for some reason, that when they offer the gospel of it, ISIS, it is not a religion that, I won't call it a religion, I won't dignify it, but it's not a theology or a philosophy that a person can willingly come and accept and, and really be regenerated by the Holy Spirit and repent of their sins and be saved. It's a despotic religion or, or, or the philosophy which, which just says, uh, we can't let you actually really have a supernatural experience and be saved, but we have got to force you to become a Muslim, which if it's done that way, they will not even be a Muslim. They're coerced and they're threatened or, or they're killed. And she said, so many of those people said, I cannot deny my faith. I'm a Christian, and you just have to kill me. And they did. Beloved, we should pray every day for those people and pray that those same people don't reach our shores. Uh, so we look at the next verse. I'm going to skip way down, running out of time. Uh, I'm going to go down to, to verse 28. Uh, Verse 28 says, And I will give unto them the sheep to hear my voice. I will give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand, my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And so, uh, he, he says to them, the ones that will hear my voice will be the ones that the Father has given to him. And we look at, uh, in John the 6th chapter, we're looking at 17.2 and, and other places in, in chapter 10. And what, what he's saying is that uh, the Father gave you to me before the foundation of the world. 
He told me which ones he would give me, which ones I would die for, which ones would be saved. Those are called the elect. Uh, those are called the sheep. Those are called the church. Those are called the bride of Jesus. And only those that the Father gave to Jesus in the everlasting covenant before the foundation of the world will be saved. They will become sheep. No one else will. Uh, that's that's what the scripture teaches. And no one else will want to. They don't have any desire to. How many people pass by, if you're a pastor, your door every Sunday morning while you're preaching? You don't see them flocking in. You don't see them having a desire to come to Jesus. They're, they're dead in their sins, their, their will and their, their mind and their emotions and everything they have is warped and is bent towards sin. And, and it's been that way since, since Adam sinned and, and passed that sin down to his posterity. People don't realize this day and time, many of them, that they're sinners. It's a hard thing to convince them that they're sinners. They think they're all right. But every single person who's been born into the world other than Jesus has been a sinner after Adam and Eve began to have children. So it's very, very difficult sometimes to, to witness to people and, and you want to shake them and you want to save them, but you know you can't. You know the Holy Spirit must save them. You know that God has his time, if they're his, that he will save them. And we had a wonderful experience today, and I'm going to close with this. We had a girl, about a lady, she's about 50 years old, she's just real young, came to our Bible study at Bottom Maturity, and she, she came but two weeks ago, she has a, a mild case of cerebral palsy, uh, she has, um, has to have metal poles to be able to hold on her arms to walk, and she said she was very depressed. And uh, she said, I want, I want to be saved. I want you to save me. And we had to, didn't do it very well in class. The people there are from different faiths and, and they're not all Calvinists. But we did tell her, well, we can't save you. We, there's nothing we can do to save you. Actually, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. God is the one who saves you. God is the one who will save you in his time when he's ready. And, and he does every single bit of saving. We don't have any part of it. He even gives us the faith uh, to repent, to believe, and, and, and gives us the repentance to repent of our sins. And so she wasn't there for a couple of weeks. Today she came back and she was upset. And she said, I, I, want, I want you to save me. I want to be saved. So we told her to stay after class. And we did. And you know, it's not as easy for we who are Calvinists as it is for Armenia because I used to be a uh, Southern Baptist Armenian evangelist for many years at the Southern Seminary and I would save people anywhere I wanted to anytime I wanted to and I thought I could save them or at least I could bring them to the Lord and, and coerce them and, 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 and cause them to be saved well I know now I can't do that because it's God only that brings salvation so we told her that, and we said, if I was to, to, to wave my hand on your head right now and tell you that you're saved, uh, I would be lying to you because I can't save you. And so we, we just began to, to there, and she began to confess her sins. She said, well, I'm a sinner. I'm very evil. She mentioned several sins. She said, I'm miserable. She said, I was involved in satanic uh, cult for a while, and I really got messed up in that. And... And, but she said, I, I really know if I die, I'm going to hell. So her whole tenor and her whole tone was different than what we are used to hearing. She was confessing that she was a sinner. She saw that she was in trouble. She, she, she wanted to not be the way that she had been, but she wanted to change and she wanted to, she wanted Jesus to save her. So still realizing we couldn't save her. We, we just told her that, that we can witness to you, tell you about Jesus, we can pray for you. We can let you pray, and we can pray with you as the days goes on, that God would regenerate you, come to you, give you spiritual life, open your eyes. 
and then begin to gently love you and pull you toward himself by the Holy Spirit and eventually give you the faith to believe and the repentance to repent of your sins. And, and I prayed for, uh, I, I prayed and asked Jesus to nullify those things that had happened to her in the satanic cult. And I, I'm certainly not charismatic, I'm totally opposed to it. But I, 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 I did tell Satan in, in the name of Jesus uh, to leave her alone, to leave her, to give up those strongholds that uh, he built there. And, and ask the Lord Jesus to have his will done in her life and just to touch her. And, 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 and we prayed with her. And then she prayed. And she told Satan very loudly, I, I don't want you anymore. I, I don't want you in my life anymore. I want to separate from you. And I want to begin to look toward Jesus, to give my life to Jesus. And then she said some, some pretty good things, good theology in our prayer. Um, she said, I want to repent of my sins. We didn't, we didn't lead her in the sinner's prayer. We didn't tell her what to pray. We just told her to pray and talk to God. And she said, of course, she never really had done that, I don't think. So she prayed a sweet prayer. And then she became emotional. And, um, and, and the amazing thing was, she lives about 30 miles from our church the last time we saw her. But she told us today that she's moving out of her mother and father's house. She's going to live with a friend who's a Christian. And she's moving into a trailer park. I think it's Pineland Trailer Park. Mobile Home Park, which is not far from us. And one of my members in Reddick was there and said, well, I'll pick you up Sunday you can come to church. We've also got a young man, Howie Pleasanton, who's on YouTube with us. He, he's in the church. He's grown up with cerebral palsy. He's called to preach. He's, he's, uh, he's been preaching for a long time. And they will have a rapport with each other. And we went to the hospital after we left Bottom Maturity to see Bob Selheimer, one of our men, who just had open heart surgery. And he was saved when he was 70 years old, he's 75 now. Very unusual. He loves the Lord. He's got tracks with him every time you, he goes anywhere. He was in the uh, uh, room where the doctors prepared him for surgery and he was reading the Bible, he was talking about the Lord, been witnessing ever since he's been there. And he said, well, that, that's where I live. I live in Springfield, uh, Pineland uh, Park, whatever it is. And they knew the very street that this girl lives on. And he said, when I get, <coughs> get recovered from this heart attack, I'll start bringing her to church and we'll bring her to church with us on Sunday. So that was amazing to me in God's providence that he moved the girl in the same trailer park that one of our very strongest sheep lives in and now he can actually bring her to our church. So, so I have very good feelings about this and that we just leave it in the Lord's hands. If, he's, if she's an elect person, if he's, she's one that God has chosen to save, then we're confident that he will save her. And we're going to do whatever we can to help, which is very little. It's basically to pray for her and love her. And, 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 and it would be wonderful one day when we can look at her and say, here is another sheep that belongs to Jesus. And here are the fruits of her life uh, that the Holy Spirit is using her. So I want to share that with you today because that doesn't happen every day. Um, and, and it's very special. And so, just because you're in the garage doesn't mean that you are a car. I thought that would cause people to remember that. Just because you're in the garage doesn't mean you are a car. And just because you're in the church doesn't mean necessarily that you're a sheep. So examine yourself, examine your fruit, examine your life, and, and ask God, are you a sheep or are you a goat? And I will pray that God will see fit according to his will, if you're one of his, to, to come to you and transform you into a sheep and into one of the followers of Jesus Christ, and one, of his, one of his disciples and one that loves him. And so thank you very much for, 
from this time. Uh, and uh, may, God, may God bless this message to his glory. Good night.